Welcome to another Authors at Google event in the San Francisco office. Some comedy troops are born to greatness. Some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Then there's Casper Hauser. Most of you are no doubt familiar with their story. John and James Richmond, first meeting in high school, forming an Indigo Girls cover band, the jaded Y chromosomes. Both going to Stanford where they met Dan Klein and Rob Baedecker, and soon discovered that they all had a shared passion to, to invent an alternative to the loofah sponge. Or as Rob later put it, to knock the self-satisfied loofah off its exalted perch. We know there has to be a better way. While this proved to be more difficult than they imagined, you can't fake exfoliation. Dan did pen a pilot for a children's cartoon series about a zany, the zany adventures of a wacky loofah sponge called Al Loof. And the rest, as they say, is history. Their next step was into comedy, which resulted in two movies, multiple tours, appearances on Comedy Central, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, the 2006 mega smash book, Sky Mall, and two new books that they'll be talking about today, Obama's Blackberry and Weddings of the Times, one written in a month, the other in a year. Please welcome Casper Hauser. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having us here today. Uh, we're Casper Hauser, the cyber terrorist uh, comedy group. And uh, we're going to thought we'd talk about our two books, Obama's Blackberry and Weddings of the Times. But we figured it'd be a waste uh, while we're here not to do a little consulting. We're also uh, a boutique consulting firm. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, <coughs> Merlin Manson uh, of the site. 43 red balloons, and we're going to look at some of the things that might help Google out. All right, so my name's Merlin. I'm going to talk to you about some stuff that really right now is too important not to talk about. I'm also the creator of 39 red balloons. We did that in Germany as well, 9 and 30 Luft balloons. Um, if, can those of you in the second and third balconies hear me okay? Okay, good. And all of you in the back left, also those of SATCOM LinkedIn from Google Fresno, and Google to Goosey Galpa, welcome, bienvenidos. Ladies and gentlemen, what if I told you that Google could be a top company? Yeah, that'd, that'd be awesome. No, Dan, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm asking them, so. Google, what if I told you that Google could be a top company by taking a few important steps? What are, yeah, what are they? Dan, don't answer back, I'm asking them, it's a rhetorical question, okay? We're going to go through some important steps right now that can take Google to the next level from being a small regional server based body of computers <laughs> into potentially a broadly based regional provider of web 1.5 and 2.0 content. Okay? I'm talking about being part of the Forbes 5000 perhaps for the first time, at least the San Jose edition. I am talking about joining the Better Business Bureau, and I'm talking potentially about a mention in the Chronicle. Okay? I think the lamp on the projectors. Okay. Now, you're hearing my, my cell phone. Yeah, Dan, that sounds fine. Um, at any rate, there are some steps here, and I have some bad news first. Okay? One is that Google needs to increase its profile. Okay, everyone in San Francisco has heard of Google, but when you get to South San Francisco or Daly City, the numbers drop off drastically. Now, I also want to point something out, and this may come as a shocker. When we searched, when we Googled the term search engine, Google came up fourth. Okay, this is not a joke. When we Google the term search engine, Google came up fourth. Okay? Now, in the Olympics, who's the fastest person to not get a medal? Uh, Piper Street. No, uh, fourth place. Okay, fourth place is the best you can be without getting a medal. The question is, can Google get on the medal podium? And that's something Casper Hauser is here to help you with today. Now, I'm not going to say that you guys are going to be dogpile overnight. Because you won't. That takes time. Months, in their case. Okay, Alta Vista, same thing. Those guys put in the work. But Google, can you get to that bronze medal podium place? I think you can. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. One of the things is you need to raise your profile, and one way is to start blogging. 
You can blog about knitting. You can blog about going to a concert. Even if you don't get tickets, you just write about how you didn't go to the concert. Next, change your name. <laughs> Google does not work as a name, and we have proven this with computers and social marketing re research, research time. that we did. Okay? Why? Because the name is a downer. Okay, say it with me. Google. 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 No, Google. Google. See, it goes down, Google. It's depressing. It's also easily mispronounced as Google in most cultures, which is an insult. <laughs> What did we do? We ran it through Deep Blue, the chess computer, and we came up with a couple of algorithmical names that are 100% perfect and available. One of them, snooples.biz. <laughs> you see how snooples is uplifting. Snooples.biz, Google. Snooples.biz. Snooples.com is taken, unfortunately. Another one that tested really positive in what we call the YA group, that's 18 to 17 year old, is the givingtree.us because Google can give back, okay, instead of just taking, taking, taking. Okay, what's next? Next is leave reviews for yourself on Amazon. It's hard to do it first, but you gotta be self serving. Don't put in the review that you know Google, okay, and don't just do a straight five star. Four and a half has more credibility. Another way to build your profile go to Dane Cook's Friendster page and then ask all of his friends if they will be a friend of Google, okay? Finally, for this page, leave the technical stuff to us, okay? One of the things that we've recently been talking about with some of the Google higher-ups is perfect matchers using GMock with C++. Who here writes in C++? Okay, how about Drupal? See? And that's where you guys need to be. What about PHP? Okay, any basic writers still? I think that you guys have stretched yourself away from what you guys are best at, which is more writing segues around and eating free food. <laughs> so we want you to leave the tech stuff to us, at least on the weekend. We're willing to be, build a firewall. We just talked to San Jose Fire Department about this. And the other thing is, get a tweeter and start twatting. Okay, another thing for you guys that's been really important is this, and this comes, you know, this company is only strong, as strong as its weakest member, okay? Ever notice that the word regret has the letters G-R-E in it? If you have not gotten a high school diploma, I would recommend you take the G-R-E as soon as possible. That can be the first step for you towards positively in yourself being that way. It's a backup plan. Uh huh. Next, stay positive. Okay, what are some features of this? One is, you know, paint this place for starters. It's a dive, really, it's a dive. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like you get the ping pong table, but come on. Next is, maybe balloons or a clown wouldn't hurt. <laughs> you know, something to just, not, you know, and last, Make your bed every morning. This is something they learned in the POW camps, but it can apply to Google as well. On this note, okay, personal power positivity in each individual building a stronger Google for tomorrow, a Google that can be in that bronze medal place, perhaps overtaking Dogpile by the year 2015. I'm going to introduce one of the best, a personal friend of mine. Please welcome Blaine Cardoza. Yeah. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, yeah. That's awesome, thank you, thank you. Thank you, awesome, good, keep it going, keep it going. Great, listen, I'm Blaine Cardoza, I'm gonna give you some tips for personal power. This is really important, listen carefully. Guys, it's so easy and you're gonna love it, all right? Things are not good right now in the world. You look really sad and confused, and that's, that's awful, that's a tragedy, right? Let's turn her tragedy into a tragitunity. Yeah? Sound good? You all up for this? All right, I'm going to teach you. This is, uh, this is important. This is Blaine Cardoza's and Casper Hauser's three pillars to achieving world record power and happiness, okay? You can do it. It's in you. But first, what's a pillar? A pillar is a support. That's an idea or belief that can change your life, all right? Pillar number one is strength. Now, what do I mean by strength? Do I mean moral strength? No. Do I mean strength of uh, uh, defense of a of a def uh, attack of service uh, 
uh, uh, hackers? No, right? I am talking about punching out a police horse, okay? Raw physical strength. I know I want it, Blaine, how do I get it? You get it by learning the pillars and following the steps and smoking a little PCP. That is a Blaine Cardoza system. Okay, so folks, pillar number two is tolerance, okay? It doesn't matter if someone is black or white, gay or straight, right? They are going to try to get you. And when they do, you need tolerance, okay, to pain, pain tolerance, right? This is my favorite part of the system, folks. A friend of mine who'd been using my system for only six hours literally flew off of a balcony onto a tractor. And do you know what he said to me? Thank you. <laughs> right? It's, uh, okay, another story. Um, this is from my own life. I had been using my system, and uh, uh, using it, I actually uh, pulled this ring out of a French fry cooker, okay? You can do it. It is, it is, it is in you. Let me, let me back up. Let me give you a little bit of uh, history of the system, okay? Um, back in the 70s, I was studying at near Stanford University, and uh, I took part in a little psychological experiment in a locked facility. They gave me PCP. So what do I do? Bend the bars, get out, make a star map, catch a deer, okay? <laughs> Later that day, the professor that, that captured me told me, Blaine, we didn't give you PCP. We gave you the placebo. What is that? What's that? What's a placebo? What is it? It's not real. Nah, it's not real. It's a sugar pill, folks. I had unleashed the natural PCP in my mind. <laughs> All right, that night I created the entire system. Now, it turns out that they had, in fact, given me quite a bit of PCP, but it didn't matter. It was too late. I'd already done it. You have to, you have to take a little PCP to get a little PCP, right? You just gotta prime the pump. You could, did you see that? I just got a thousand ideas. All right, tell you what, pa, pa, pa. Who wants to get up here uh, and uh, I'll, I'm gonna punch you in the balls. This would be no, good. Dan, uh, that's uh, for Yahoo at two o'clock. Oh, yeah, all right, what did you do, Yahoo? All yeah. right, folks, that's it for me. I'm Blaine Cardoza, Three Pillars. I'm out. Poof, poof. Thank you, Blaine. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. One of the things that's also very important to us recently, we have um, written a couple of books that we want to talk about today. First, we want to show you, by way of introduction, a brief video that should be a good introduction. Weddings are a wonderful, happy time for any couple. In this video, you'll learn how to respond to basic wedding emergencies so that your wedding can be a safe, fun, and happy time for all. When you hear this beep, take time to review with your instructor. If you think the bride has cold feet, ask, what's the matter? What's the matter? I think I f***ed up. I shouldn't be marrying Stephen. If she seems concerned, help her to understand the situation. It's too late. All the guests are here. You have to go through with it. But everyone thinks Stephen's a dickhead. Validate the bride's concerns. Everyone thinks that on their wedding day. Then slap the bride firmly on the right and left cheek. Administer a glass of white wine and two Xanax to the bride until she shows signs of calming down. Place your right and then left forearms under the bride's armpits. Form a modified bear lock under the breasts. Then lift the bride, escorting her to the ceremony. <laughs> if a guest has eaten too much cake, first ask, did you eat too much cake? Did you eat too much cake? If he says yes, he has eaten too much cake. Lie the person on their back, using your hand as a pillow. Gently rub the abdomen in a circular motion. This will free up the cake. Next, ask if you can look in his mouth and stick your finger in his mouth. Is it okay if I look in your mouth and stick my fingers in your mouth? <laughs> look for the cake. If you see cake, gently sweep the cake off the tonsils in an arcing U motion into a basket or nearby pool. Does that feel better? All right, thanks. So um, our second, we have, we have three books. Um, 
our first one was Sky Mall, uh, which was a parody of the Sky Mall, the in-flight catalog. And that came out in October 31st of, of 2006. And then we, we wrote a second book for St. Martin's Press, which was Weddings of the Times, a parody of the New York Times wedding announcements. Then by sheer coincidence, we ended up having another book come out uh, essentially on the same day. Weddings of the Times, and we're going we're gonna to go th read, read a couple of these selections. And this purple just goes out like that. That's the first one. So these purple things don't come with the book? Yeah, the purple is us. You don't get the purple. Go ahead. Carolyn Hansen was married to Dean Van Wyck on Saturday at the Peachtree Farm in Scarsdale, New York. The bride, 33, wore a strapless white Vera Wang wedding gown. The bridegroom, 38, wore tight-fitting purple breeches, a white silk shirt, a fox fur mantle, and a livery collar from which was suspended a diamond the size of a walnut. His wide sleeve doublet gave emphasis to his upper body, which was accentuated with shoulder pads. Mr. Van Wyck's padded codpiece was stuffed with jewels and weapons. He carried a staff made of silver and bedecked with topaz. There was obviously some kind of miscommunication, said the bride. <laughs> so we practiced the handover before, and it worked much better. All right. Frank Allswang and Scott per Perino were joined in civil union at the Union Civil War battlefield at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on Thursday. <laughs> Mr. Perino and Mr. Allswang are, are co-founders of Confederates in the Closet, a living history organization that through its weekend reenactments, slideshows, and private parties, imagines what it would have been like to be gay and fighting for states' rights in the 1860s. Glenn Dorio, a scuba diving instructor, and Brittany Dowling, a professional photographer, held an underwater wedding ceremony in a shark cage near the Dyer Islands off the coast of South Africa. Funeral services are scheduled for next Friday. I guess they don't like scuba diving. <laughs> Marta Green and Nate Serrata were married on Friday at the Sun Horizons Convention Center in Sarasota, Florida. Rabbi Tom Goldwitz officiated. The couple met in the online virtual world known as Second Life. Mr. Sirota's screen character, or avatar, is a four-legged centaur with a rippling human torso and the arms and head of James Bond actor Daniel Craig. The instant I saw him, I fell in love, said the bride. I'm a huge D&D &D girl, plus I love Daniel Craig. You should see her avatar, said the groom. It's a dolphin with a human tongue. Plus, she's got wings and she's a surgeon. Asked how they planned to spend their honeymoon, the couple replied, cyberlingus and pixelatio. It's the outermost one, Dan, the it's outermost the purple. The man and the woman from the bathroom door married each other on Saturday at Telco Park. For the ceremony, the bride and groom chose a clean, modern look. The groom wore pearl-colored Nehru tuxedo with matching cashmere stump covers. The bride wore a necklace ivory A-line dress that accentuated her chewable vitamin C-shaped head and fun dip legs. For their honeymoon, the couple is planning to mail themselves to Belize. So those are some of the, the, the entries in this book. One of the m most difficult things about this book was getting permission from couples to allow us to make fun of them. I, and um, it, you, we, uh, we finally kind of distinguished what the price of people's um, integrity is because we went down to the ferry building on Saturday for Saturday market and we just said we will pay you ten dollars uh, to take your picture and it had a little disclaimer there that says we will make fun of you it, it, the write-up will be humiliating etc and people were just lined up I mean there's just total disbelief um, and then the other place that we got a lot of the photos was actually after one of our shows in Santa Cruz and we said we'll give you a free copy of Sky Mall which so that shows you that in Santa Cruz, with the discount price, the price of integrity is almost 60% lower than at the ferry building. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we were able to get them. The, the book was timed for release during wedding season. So it was actually ready considerably before, I mean, considerably uh, much earlier than, than it was actually released. So we were sitting around with this and ended up with another book deal kind of uh, that caught up with it. And we ended up with the books released one day apart. Our second book is Obama's Blackberry, which um, is on Little Brown. Actually, our second book this month um, is on Little Brown, and it is essentially a, a parody of, of 
the, the president's texts and emails. And um, we actually build a website, and if you want to escape and go to um, Firefox, it's a browser. There you go. And we'll read some of these. So you want to read the non-Obama one? Okay. Okay, this is from Michelle Obama. You looked cute on CNN. Really? Hmm. Can you get away for 15 minutes? Yes, I can. Good, because Bo Barfed in the West Wing needs to be cleaned up. This is from Dr. Dre, the motherfucking doctor. Consider me for Surgeon General? Uh, sorry, uh, only open to medical doctors. Now my name is Dre, the motherfucking doctor, ripping shit up and here to rock ya. Uh, okay, bye. <laughs> uh, hey, hon, we, we need to remind Sasha not to leave toys in the Oval Office. Hmm? I just found a Tickle Me El Elmo under the desk. Not Sasha's. Huh? Check tag. George. I've started a box to mail to Laura. <laughs> Text from Nicolas Sarkozy, President of France. Sarkozy Bear. Bonjour, Monsieur President Obama. Poudrette nous devrions échanger de femmes? Zwing. No, I don't think we should trade wives. <laughs> Couldn't find Zwing in the French dictionary later. This is a text message from Tony Blair. Blair today. Did you see The Queen? Yes. Michael Sheen plays me in it. I, I know. Helen Mirren is in it, too. Uh, uh, working right now. <laughs> I really did that stuff in the movie. Busy. Okay. Did you see Chariots of Fire? <laughs> okay, here's a, 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 an email from service at paypal.com to Barack Obama. Subject, receipt for your payment, for your PayPal payment to AIG Incorporated. <laughs> you have sent $170 billion to AIG Inc. for a bailout. Payer name, Barack Obama. Funding source, grandchildren's credit card. <laughs> A text message from Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Dennis the Menace. Hey, Prez, kudos on new White House veg garden. Thanks. <laughs> okay, if I plant some stuff, heirloom tomatoes. Uh, let me check with Michelle. Also, rainbow chard, oregano, bergamot, some echinacea, smearwort. It's a pretty small plot. BC greenbud, pineapple skunk, white widow, purple kush, Mexican sticky stank. Turning off phone now. Mushrooms. <laughs> okay, this is a text from Hel Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State. Why didn't I get Vice Prez? Joe's funner to be around. In what way? Christopher Walken impersonations, can rock the cradle on a yo-yo, plays banjo, knows trivia, makes good chili, does a few magic tricks, doesn't run against me in the primary. Okay, I get it. Uh, okay, this is from the YouTube service to the president at us.gov. Subject, Dick Cheney sent you a video. Baby panda bear sneezing. <laughs> hey, W, this is 10 times cuter than the one you sent me. You have to watch to the end. He starts to sneeze, then falls asleep. Then, oh, my God, he wakes up by sneezing. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Don't you just want to hug every baby panda you see? <laughs> Dick. From Dick Cheney to the president at us.gov. Subject, please delete my last email. Baby panda sneezing. Dear President Obama, I mistakenly sent a video to what is now your address. I will shoot a baby panda if you mention this to anyone. <laughs> Seriously, Dick Cheney. Okay. So those are some, actually some of those are in the book and some of those are, are um, entries that didn't make it into the book. We had a very um, surprising turn of events when this book, uh, in sort of pre-publicity, about the week before this book came out. You oh, so, so foxnews.com ran a, a funny story about uh, Obama's BlackBerry, about how the cyber terrorist group, Casper Hauser, had hacked into the president's BlackBerry. And uh, Little Brown, our publisher, was threatening to publish the messages uh, on June 8th. And in the third paragraph, Fox News said, unless it's all a joke, the Iranians didn't read to the third paragraph. Uh, the press TV, their, their state-run media organization, ran a story saying that a 
virtual terrorist group named Casper Hauser had hacked into the president's BlackBerry and was going to publish through Little Brown his correspondence. Uh, this was a serious breach. Uh, this group, Casper Hauser, had somehow hacked in there. Um, no, no tip off really to the uh, to the joke part. Um, the uh, otherwise written in perfect English, but this story uh, ran uh, right around the time the book came out and was picked up by a number of other uh, websites and news organizations. And we never heard back from the Iranians, but as far as they know, uh, we've we've spilled the contents of. Yeah, book. including Huff, HuffPo picked it up. The, the the story that Iranian state press labels sketch comedy troupe cyber terrorists. And we learned so much basically from the comments to all of these things because there would be these completely inane comment wars at the bottom of these pages and nobody seemed to ever, no matter who they were, like all the HuffPo ones were, Fox News sucks. <laughs> That's all people said. There's no comment really on the substance of the actual thing. And then people would talk about whether, oh, it's just a stunt or it was just lit, et cetera. And we had actually nothing to do with it. It just happened completely in our, you know, uh, absence of, of action. Um, but it was, uh, um, uh, it was only one of two kind of international responses to the book that we had. Another was is that a Wall Street Journal article, just a standard book write-up was done about a week, a week before it came out. And the author of the Wall Street Journal uh, article, because on the cover of the book, you see that um, Biden, Joe Biden is asking at the end of the email if he can leave at 4.45. And um, she contacted Biden's, uh, 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 basically, uh, spokesman. And, and the spokesman came back with a, a long and detailed quote about um, the nature of parody and, that, and how parody must need to be based on, like, something about the actual person, some actual... So we were being lectured by, le lectured by Biden's office on, on proper parody. So we, we, we were thrilled that they took the time to respond in great detail about how busy he was and all the trips he'd gone on and he was working on the bailout and he'd just gotten back from an overseas trip. So we thought that was nice. They took a, a lot of time to explain that, that he was busy. We were, we were flattered. Yeah. yeah. And, um, one of the things that we had already explained to the author, and one of the things that we tried to do in this book is to not let the book write itself. We had even told that to the, to the author that Biden long-winded jokes are not going to be funny to anybody, and that only by kind of wandering off into a new character for Biden, and that there's some sort of resonance to the, ne to, to the notion of Biden being an employee now and leaving at 445, even though nobody actually thinks that Biden is like that. Um, but that was all fortunately left out of the article. Um, do you guys have any questions for us? We have another um, um, sort of uh, um, germane little um, piece for you guys that we want to do after. But we want to do that after a little bit of Q&A. So if you guys have any questions or comments for us. Yes. Okay. Okay, so if and he doesn't, have, we don't have mics for the crowd. So if you didn't hear the question, the question is: Does doing comedy is it, has it, does it get you women or partners? Um, <laughs> and the answer is yes, it did for all of us. And it's a night. No, the question's a good one. Uh, working as a group in yeah, comedy. Yeah. So so it's it is challenging to work creatively as a group, and we we wrestle with it all the time. I mean, there are there's always conflicts, and there's and there's always sort of. Um, things that we're up, ag up against and trying to solve. I think that one of, one of our greatest um, assets is that we often use those conflicts and end up sort of sticking them into bits and, and pieces. So at some level, we have, to, we have to remember that it's all material. Uh, I, that's one of the things. The other thing is um, we come from a background of really playing together. Like it's been work for the past few years, but underneath is play. Um, we did, uh, whether that was improvisation, we actually met working at a summer camp. So like doing skits 20 years ago. And I think from that foundation, we can still kind of play with each other, uh, mess with each other. Uh, in general, we're all rooting for each other. Whoever gets the laugh, as long as it's a laugh, that's what counts. Those are, those are some of our answers. And practically speaking, one, oh, go ahead, Rob. Oh, well, I was going to address the practical yeah. one, too. But, but uh, one thing we do to, um, well, we use Google Docs uh, to write this book, to write both books. And th one of the reasons we did that is to make contributions, contributions anonymous. Because 
working in a group, especially one that you've been in for a long time, you get really tied to people's personalities and you start to um, maybe prejudge ideas. Uh, either way, right? Either that it's going to be good or, or uh, flawed or, or a special tone. You, you know, you, you come to it with all these preconceptions. So we would upload our entries individually onto Google Docs, vote on them anonymously. You know, they'd just be numbered. Uh, and then from there, take the highest vote getters and work in a group. And then all, all the personality stuff could, could enter at that point. But we found that um, removing that, those, as much as we could, the, those personal um, kinds of baggage that you often bring was, was a big help. So. Yeah, I think that, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, there's one other thing that we've just, just, just started doing recently. You're actually seeing how this works in person <laughs> that I, I get shit on, just completely we, shit on. We randomly, it's like that in rehearsal too. It's exactly like randomly this in rehearsal. Randomly, we've started to um, <laughs> wrap it up, Dan. We've started to, we've actually started to lead workshops on Greek group creativity, which has been a really fascinating way for us to dig a little deeper and figure out how how are we doing that. I mean, it's been almost nine years, and somehow. Uh, Right before breaking up, we thought we would sort of do these workshops and see how, wh how did we get this far and can we go any farther? Yeah. It, really, it really actually helped to crystallize. Like doing the, we just did uh, a couple of creativity workshops at Max FunCon, which is Jesse Thorne's um, uh, conference down there in Southern California, and it helped to crystallize what it, what it is that we were doing. And I think a couple of things that we learned is this. Conflict is not a sign of illness in the group process. It's unpleasant, and in a way, you're sometimes fighting for your ideas. And what we realized is that it was important for us to decide where we essentially were in the creative process, especially in comedy, where you can be quite wild. And so there's sort of this um, time to grow and uh, time to, there really is. And there's a time to be very open and uncritical, and then there's a time to be ruthlessly critical. I mean, that's at least what it is in comedy, is that we've been very empirical. If it doesn't work, it's out. It's just, that's the way it goes. But there is a lot of, there is a lot of status transaction, and you realize that working in a group, a lot of what you're dealing with is personality, not the strength of ideas. And that's why with Google Docs, especially with short, now we've never written a novel together, and we're writing a screenplay right now. Long form's gonna be a little different, but these books are short subject, all of them have been, so people can submit on their own, and we actually, when we write in a room, we project um, scripts onto a wall. Uh, so we just, you know, we project our Google Docs or whatever, final draft, onto a wall and the four of us sit around and you do all your rewrites just looking at the wall at this giant screen of your script um, and do your rewrites as a group. And everything in the end is entirely collaboratively written. One other important part is one of our members, John Richmond, is not here today. And that's um, something we should mention about the creative process. If you're not getting along with, with one guy, you get off the bus before he sees that you're getting off and then he ends up Hopefully in Alameda, going across the or, bridge or, or somewhere, going. but you know, <laughs> lot, uh, far away that it, it, he'll get back by the time we're done. Yeah, and he's but been that calling. He's, not hurt. he's been calling this and whole time. You leave him some snacks yeah. and some juice. Yeah, and uh, it works out. Um, any other questions? We'll do a short answer on another. Yes, question. Nick. Okay, so another question about sex, um, <laughs> if you have in the back balconies, is about do we have, um, so the question is how much time do we have for, for creative stuff since we all have day jobs as well? Um, well, some of our day jobs dovetail very, very nicely with writing comedy. I mean, Rob is a, a, a freelance writer, Dan teaches improv at Stanford and, and uh, sketch comedy at Stanford. So those things are very highly complimentary. John and I have day jobs that are not necessarily entirely complimentary. I'm a psychiatrist and my brother's an attorney. Um, but the job, structure is um, is sort of open to it. We, we're not nine to five. I wonder if my employers are going to watch this. Yeah. We, so we are nine to five. Um, <laughs> No, so so our job our, our job structures have been sort of tailored, but but the answer is it's a lot of work. You end up essentially having two jobs because it's, it's much more than a hobby. Um, it doesn't entirely pay the bills yet, but um, you know it's not just been like our little fun weekend thing either. Um, the creative process part starts to get swallowed up as you get more notoriety or more success and you end up spending a lot of time on uh, answering emails and making sure people's calendars are cl clear and you have to push back and we're just realizing that now too like it, it's so much fun when you start a rehearsal with improv and you're just going straight to the creative and say forget talking about whether we're going to take this deal or whatever because uh, that stuff is just not what you went into it for.
What what deal is that? <laughs> <laughs> With um, um, hush puppies. Okay. <laughs> uh, hush puppies I, wants us to do. I don't want that to get in the way of um, our improv. Uh, any other questions? Somebody way back in the <laughs> second balcony up there. Uh, I can't. I can't. How hear did you, I really love your guys' stuff. How did you guys get so brilliant? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, Uh, I'll, I'll, s I'll start with a few. Um, we're uh, big British comedy fans. We did the Edinburgh Fringe Festival a few years back and um, met a lot of great comics there that we're still fans of. And, and um, uh, Count Arthur Strong, uh, a guy named Steve Delaney, is a, one of our comedy heroes. Uh, you should look him up. Um, he's a brilliant character comic. We were always big friends, fans of um, Chris Morris, uh, Brass Eye, uh, again, stuff that didn't get a ton of play over here, but really brilliant um, news parody, and he's done a ton of stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll pass it on to James. Peter Cook and Peter Sellers, both the Peters. Um, and and I, I, I'm like, it runs the gamut, too. Like, I, I, I'm at one end of the comedy nerd spectrum, very much a comedy nerd. Um, John thinks that SNL is the worst thing that ever happened to American comedy and doesn't claim to recognize any members of Monty Python. That's my twin brother. So it's, it just kind of runs the gamut. Cheech and Chong, very big for us, too. Cheech and Chong, for sure. I mean, I have to admit, I, when I was a kid, it was Steve Martin. It was, you know, pretty, like, all the, all the big stuff. Um, yeah. Also, writers like, you know, like Jack Handy, um, Donald Barthelme. Um, uh, George Saunders. George Saunders, uh, Beckett, you know. Um, yeah. sort of uh, Mark Lazenby, Doreen <laughs> Jones, Fred <laughs> Lewis, um, lots of great writers. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. It was a version of a uh, phone call to the 14th century. Yeah, so the question is that we did the parodies, and then when we actually went on uh, uh, This American Life, we, we ended up doing a straight sketch. Um, well, was we just, just, you know, we, we had pitched that sketch to them um, years ago, actually. It was an old sketch of ours. It's a phone call to the 14th century, a game show where you're calling the 14th century to impart as much useful knowledge as you can. Um, and years ago, we pitched it, and uh, they kind of said they liked it, and we never heard it. And then in the meantime, we did the parody. Um, we were told they, they'd all heard it. Um, not, not sure. You know, it was an homage as much as a parody. We're, we're big fans. And, um, but we, we never directly pitched the parody to them. Uh, and they happened to have this show whose theme was um, Wrong Side of History. And so it sort of they recalled the sketch, and it, it fit, and they asked us to to do some new new things to it, and so we, we did a slightly altered version. Yeah. So that's how it came about. But, yeah. but we would love to do uh, our parody of This American Life on the real This American Life. I think then the, the earth would explode. Yeah, yeah. The, the snake eats its tail <laughs> on that day. The Aztecs predicted that, yes. Uh, I would say that we are all liberal and that these guys are getting more and more conservative as they get older. We haven't really talked about this, but they're like, they're, they're getting kind of weird. No, I, I, it, this is, that was a, that's a really good question. The question is, how, what is our political stance and how did that affect uh, writing the book? Is that uh, accurate? Um, and it was a tricky thing because comically we wanted to make sure to get our laughs from wherever we could get them. Um, and. Uh, and we did try to poke fun of people on both sides. We tried to um, not push too strong of an agenda. But yeah, we, we all were Obama supporters. And, and one of the things that we found sort of funny was the way, the way he was sweeping into office with so many things that he had to do and how, how many things he was trying to do. And so that was part of, part of the game in, in writing the book. It became uh, clear to us that he was the straight man early on. You know, you had this kind of circus going on around him, and the best voice for him was to sort of react mostly. Uh, and so that that wasn't a political decision necessarily, more a um, 
kind of comedy decision. We need a straight man in this book. He's, he, you know, he's the, the sort of, uh, you know, even keel, no drama guy, as we all know, and it just worked out that way. And we really noticed, too, that with the culture wars, if you want to call them that the way they are, people n want to know what lane you're in. And, and we're really glad with how the, we're, we're thrilled with how the book is doing. And I think one of the things very early on was people wondering on HuffPo, like, especially since we were on Fox News the very first time, they're going, wait a sec, because they, they, they want to know definitely before they buy. And I think they know now that really the book is fairly gen gentle. It's, it's not very harsh or mean really to either side. It's really so hopefully about comedy that's done in, in a way that's fresh and unexpected and good. But, um, you know, with a title like uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh is a big fat idiot, you have a straight, uh, you know, you have a straight line audience and another group that's never ever going to pick that book up. And, and we sort of realized it's, it's probably good to be in one of those lanes. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we belong to a couple of political parties, um, uh, but they're, we tend to, we are, we are all Obama supporters. There was another question over there. Yeah, you know, well, see, we've actually, we've never done this stuff live uh, until today. Um, and um, um, the audience, the, the, you know, it plays really well at Dan's house. You know, we've, we've had some incredible shows at Dan's house. Uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving shows. Thanksgiving, my aunts and, and my aunts are just in love with, with the twins. Yeah, and, it's, yeah, it's one of our favorite venues, you know, is the big Thanksgiving show at the Klein household. And it's usually sold out. And we'll have like 24 people there. Um, they love our stuff. No, the response has been really good. It's been very positive. And um, I, I think part of that is because we, um, we really tried to create new real estate here for these characters so that you just didn't read the same old thing. Um, and um, because that's just not interesting. And people think, they may think that they know what's in this book by looking at the cover. And I hope with all three of our books, we avoided that fate almost entirely, that uh, it really is about the writing with us. It's really about sitting down and not just as a gift, like, oh, this is funny, you know, fun little thing. Um, okay, so, yes. The question is, that do we do comedy writing for talk shows or other shows. We've done a very little of that. We um, sometimes like an awards thing or the SF Film Festival. Yeah, we, we wrote, wrote jokes. We for wrote a couple of jokes for uh, for the main presenter there. Um, I mean, we have management in LA, so we go down and take meetings with you know Fox and we Cartoon Network. We hired for stuff. some uh, some interesting gigs that weren't like traditional talk shows, but we did a uh, a website through HBO um, Digital about a y last year. Um, called Wonder Glen, and um, we were hired to write this completely fake uh, intranet site of a, of a uh, dysfunctional production company in LA. And so it's all of their, um, it's still up, wonderglen.com. It's all of their um, ex inter office exchanges, the politics, the relationships, and all of their failed projects. Um, and uh, so we got to write all these little demos for TV series they wanted to make. One called Hobbit House, where they turn people's regular houses into Hobbit homes. Uh, one called uh, Lightning Rods, where they invited people who had already been struck by lightning to come back and try to win a, uh, a Chevy uh, truck Rado. by getting struck again. Um, <laughs> and then just all the documents. It's very, very detailed, and it's lots of wormholes in there. But uh, that was one of the unusual writing gigs that, that we've had in the entertainment industry. Yeah. And we have uh, uh, a little bit of a, uh, we're working with Graham Linehan uh, at Talkback Productions, uh, and, and um, he has done some wonderful shows in Britain, so it's kind of like this big dream, because we, we do look up to the British shows. We like the American shows, too. Um, if we want to do the, the little scammer thing, we should yeah. do that right now. Yeah, too. We have a little bit of time at the end, at the end of the QA, if there's no real burning questions. Um, we have been baiting Nigerian scammers for some number of years. And uh, and uh, one of the, the this is so this is a true email correspondence that we had with one of them, and um, and um, in this particular exchange we always use the same character Jock Plenary, and um, and we will use the actual name of the scammer that he gave. So this is all tr this is all r real. This particular Nigerian scam works this way: you post an expensive item on uh, Craigslist, usually a ridiculous item, so you can filter out all the the normal people who aren't scamming you. They would never buy it, and. Uh,
And um, the way they, they do this is they say, yeah, I want to buy your bike. Um, can I send you a check for $3,000? let us say the bike is 2100 Can I send you a check for 3000 as long as you send me the change? Okay? And y you send them the change, which is a real check. They keep that. And their check doesn't clear, and you never hear from them again. That's how this particular scam works. So James will read uh, the part of Jock Plenary, the yeah. actual yes. um, Casper House part, and I'll read Thomas Daniels' part. Hello, I saw your advertisement on the web, and I decided to meet you about the purchase of your 2003 Turner bicycle. Hope to hear from you soon. Regards, Thomas Daniel. Thomas, this is the original 22-inch dropout karate bicycle. The bars are shaped like horns. I will be home today drinking Thunderbird before my trial until 3 p.m. <laughs> They say I bottle hit someone slash thing. Yours, Jock Plenary, partial online master's degree. Hello, thanks for your swift response, and I am okay with the price, and I will send a check for 3000 and it clears you will have to send the balance to my shipper in USA. Thanks, regards. Thomas, before I send the money, what color bike do you want? It changes the price. A, green. B, seafoam. B, seafoam. C, verdant mega pinaz. Please tell me the color today so I can send the money. Miss you, Jock. <laughs> Hello, Jock. Thanks for the mail, and I want the green color, so I will like you to go and send the money to the shipper now. Regards. Thomas, sorry we don't have any more green paint. Is it okay if I paint it? Verdant Mega Panaz. <laughs> as soon as you pick a color, I will send the balance today. You love God, Jock. <laughs> Now, at this point, we sent him $2 via Western Union to London. It costs $18 to send money on Western Union. So the woman was looking at me saying, you're going to spend nine times as much to spend it. At any rate, when you send money via Western Union, you get what is called an MTCN control number. That's the number you need to give to the recipient. They need to walk into the Western Union in that other country with that number in order to get the money. So the MTCN control number is real here, and that's what he's asking for. Thomas, I sent the balance. For security reasons, I placed the MTCN and control number in the following sentence. Two hobbits and two fairies live near me in the glen. The ten numbers in the sentence in order are the control number. I can't wait for this to be settled. In my mental mind, you have sat on my lap like a little silky terrier, Thomas. You are like a little crystal hobbit fairy in my barn. I love you, Jock. The total cost for Verdant Mega Panaz is $29.98. Hello, Jock. Are you kidding me or what? My shipper went to the bank to take the money for the pickup of the bike, and they get to know that you send only $2? What is going on? Thomas, I told you the total cost was $29.98 for the Verdant Mega Panaz color. Your business partner sent me $3,000. That means the balance is $2. Conclusion, you were being a hippie. Repeat, you're being a hippie, and now you'll have to pay. I'm sorry. I trust you. You and God and I are a threesome. <laughs> Jock Plenary, half marathoner. Hello, Jock. How are you doing? I would like to confirm if you have sent the money. Get back to me immediately. Thomas, I cannot send the money tonight because it is midnight here and I'm in the hospital. A wino attacked my uncle at the aquarium. I will send the balance as soon as I can. Hopefully tomorrow. Sincerely, Jock Plenary. Please understand, the penis is not a muscle. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Hello, Jock. Thanks for the message, and I am very sorry for the condition of your uncle, and I think you will get better by God's grace, and I would like to tell you to go as soon as possible to send the money. Regards. Dear Thomas, thank you for bequeathing a special blessing all up into my uncle. <laughs> he is very injured, and the doctors say he's still too horny to operate. Why did I even go to the aquarium? I've sent a photo of Uncle Gabriel and his doctor, who has asked me to go horseback riding. That's a picture of them, by the way, at Stanford operating on Coco the Gorilla. <laughs> I will send the balance if I can get out of the hospital today. Help me, Obi-Wan. Jock Plenary. Hello, Jock. How are you doing? Hope things are all right. I am here waiting for your urgent response, and I would like to confirm if you have sent the money. Thanks. Regards. Thomas, I'm still at the hospital. Bad news. My uncle's condition has been downgraded from very fine to F minus. <laughs> Should I send my grandma's boyfriend, Pampa, to send the money? You're my best friend, Jock. <laughs> Hello, Jock. How are you doing? Well, your uncle will be all right. I am here praying for his health, and I would like you to send your grandma's boyfriend to send the money as soon as possible. <laughs> Regards. Thomas, thanks for the kind words about Uncle Gabriel. He's just starting to say fuck, so that's good. <laughs> I'm so mad at aquariums and winos. Trust me, the money will arrive soon. I can't wait to be in your arms again. 
Jack Plenary. <laughs> I am here waiting for your urgent response and the MTCN control number. Thomas, Pampa sent the money. I will hide the MTCN control number in the following sentence. R2-D2 and C-3PO went to Moby Dick's for a rave and got stoned and laid. Jock, please do not encode the control number because I don't understand. The control number you sent was 13 numbers and it have to be 10 numbers. Thomas. R2-D2 and C-3PO are robot names, not part of the code. Repeat, they are robots of Star Wars. Do not use the numbers from any names of robots in the code. Repeat, bang the drum slowly. Jock Plenary, P.S. Uncle Gabriel is feeling better. He got a tube salad through the nose. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We're Casper Hauser.